Are we are we all caught up on all of our superhero movies? Has everybody been been tracking all of these? I I gave up after Avengers Endgame. I was like, that's Endgame for me. Like we're done. Like there's just way too many. But are, are you familiar with this? Everybody familiar with like superheroes, comics? All right, you've got a, you got the Avengers, right? We got the Avengers. We all know who the Avengers are. Maybe right? if you've seen them around, Captain America, X Men. That's one of my. That's kind of one of my favorites. All right, you've got Batman. You've got all these. I, I've got, I think I've got some images of these to kind of help you uh, think through this. But show the show the Inver- Avengers. Let's start. Let's start with there. You've got uh, you've got Iron Man. You've got Captain America. You've got uh, Captain Marvel. I, somebody's gonna have to help me out eventually. Um, you've got the X Men. You know that's the big one with with Wolverine. He's kind of the most famous one, I think. Batman. Very familiar with Batman. We're at least familiar with Batman. Even if it's like Adam West Batman, you at least know. Batman. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, this is from the 90s, is Blank Man. Anybody know about Blank Man from the mid-90s? Okay. No? Yeah, I think it got a, Taylor, I think you told me it's got like a 12 on Rotten Tomatoes in the mid-90s, but that's what I grew up with, uh, with Damon Wayans. So, you know, fun, uh, fun, fun times. But, you know, if you, if you watch these, if you've been in the middle of, of these series, you start figuring out, like, the whole point of of the superhero, like their entire job is centered around like fighting for good. Like they're defending good. It's, it's good versus evil. But the problem is, is in the midst of a lot of these stories, what happens is, as I've noticed is like, like they start kind of, maybe there's some internal turmoil. Something starts happening where you're like, wait a minute. Like, I thought you guys were the good guys. I can't figure this out. I mean, Avengers has a movie called Civil War where they start fighting against each other. I'm going, I, I, so you're fighting yourselves now? I thought you were the good guys. I'm, I'm, really con- I'm really confused, just like probably you are now. And the whole point, right, is if they're fighting, if it's good versus evil, I should be able to tell who is good and who's not the entire time. There should not be any sort of uh, of, of mixed message. And so as we, we really, we're, this is the beginning of our series, The Good Life. Uh, Pastor Jeff did a great job of just really unpacking a lot of this uh, last week, giving us an overview of, of what's going to be happening over the next several weeks as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount. You heard Pastor Jeff say this, that the church has lost its way in America. And so what we're trying to do is we just want to recapture the way of Jesus, our lamps have been dimmed, our lamps have been, have been covered, and so the, the lines between Christianity and culture really have been, have been blurred. You've had a lot of people try to redefine uh, what the church is. You've had a lot of people try to redefine uh, what it means to follow Jesus, what many of us would call uh, discipleship, and I don't think we need to re- redefine anything. We just need to recapture and be reminded of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And so in this cultural climate where everything kind of gets just jumbled together, we have an opportunity as the church to take a different stance and follow the way of Jesus. So as we unpack this this passage, we're going to answer this question today. We're going to be looking at salt and light. What does it mean? What does it mean to be salt and light? What does it mean to be salt and and light. Well, really what we'll discover is that there's three areas in which we work and they're all centered uh, around what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So uh, we're going to be in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And I want you, I want you to either use your phone or use your Bible and I want you to follow along with me. I'm not going to be showing the text on the screen this morning. I want you to be able to, to, to follow, follow along with me. So I'll give you a chance to kind of get there. It's in the New Testament. Matthew's that first gospel as we, um, as we unpack the entire uh, Sermon on the Mount. But you see this where Jesus sits down in this area and he starts teaching all of these followers. And he's really what he starts doing is he spe- he's speaking identity into his followers. And so he's north of the sea, sea of Galilee. Pastor Jeff, again, did a great job of really setting this up. And this, this is not just one sermon. This is, this is actually, he would do this multiple times. And it's core preaching of the kingdom of God. And so what follows the Beatitudes are, are these kind of these case studies. 
And so you see Jesus at the end of, uh, of the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it leads into uh, this, this 13 through 16 passage, which serves as a, as a fitting conclusion to the Beatitudes. All right, so Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Let's read this and let's follow along together. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall, sal- how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. How do we, uh, how do we be salt and light during this cultural moment? The first thing we do is we work to hinder evil. We work to hinder evil evil. You see what Jesus says here, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything. I think how you're supposed to say that is good for nothing. If you're in Texas or the South, I think. I think. I'm not sure. The you here, when he says you are the salt of the earth, that is plural. Jesus is addressing all these followers, so he includes everyone. It's a collective charge. So there's this plural aspect to this, that we, but we, the church, is included in this. So that, but there's also this individual piece where collectively, as an individual, you're also doing this. And so this is the shared identity that we have with Christ Jesus. And salt has, has many uses, right? It, it preserves, it enhances flavor, it melts ice, it helps make ice cream. That's what Stacy did over Labor Day. It helps, plant, it helps plants absorb nutrients. It can keep pests away. But what is Jesus talking about when he talks about salt? Like for the most part, his hearers would, would know what Jesus is talking about because they're familiar with the covenant and the role of salt. Jesus loves the Old Testament, and so he, he draws from it often. I can't go into all the details, but if, if you want to, there's a book called The Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing. That's by Jonathan Pennington. Bible Project guys, they have a lot of stuff on there. It's a, their, their podcast has a lot of stuff about this. Uh, this is what Zoe and I listened to on our way to school. But as a sign of loyalty, salt was eaten by itself to commit to a covenantal agreement. In other words, Jesus is telling his followers, you're carrying on this covenant. For those who are in Christ, we are now united with Christ to bring about the new covenant. And so we're, we're ushering in his, his, his kingdom. It's through the advancement of, of the gospel. And so we do that by preserving the goodness of God that's in the world. When you preserve the good, you enhance the flavor. And so ultimately, we act as agents that promote the gospel for the purpose of the kingdom of God. On the flip side... Anyone who rejects this idea or you fail to, to live this out is worthless. No longer good for anything is what Jesus says. And so we ask, well, can, can salt, you know, can it actually lose it, its saltiness? No, chemically, it's impossible to do so. The, po- the point Jesus is making is that if it did, it would no longer be of any value. Anybody grow their own, own tomatoes? You know, you got to use a tomato cage. Anybody familiar with this? All right, if you're, uh, we try. If you're interested in tomato ministry, just find me afterwards. I would love some help. But like the whole cage, right, is to hold the plant together. So as it grows up through the cage, it's, it's being preserved so that the plant can actually produce good fruit, right? The, to, the actual tomato. If the cage ever stops doing its job or it's, t- it's taken away, the, the plant breaks. It can't stay together and it dies and it withers. And so in a similar way, followers, followers of Jesus, we're, we're like that cage. We're holding the world together. This is the job of the church. And we're preserving God's creation. 
You say, well, how do I preserve the good? What, is this really, what does this really look like? Well, now we're, we're heralds, is what Jesus would say. We're, we're messengers of the gospel. We have a message to share. We're preserving the holiness. It's by speaking up when there's, when there's an injustice, or maybe another way to say it is when there's mistreatment. As followers of Christ, we fight for others. And so there's two aspects I'm going to focus on here. It's mistreatment and it's care. Those are just the two I want to focus on. But when it comes to, when it comes to mis- mistreatment, my next gen guys, all right, my, my, my kiddos, all right, students, what does it look like to stand up for somebody when they're being bullied? What's it look like in this day and age to stand up for somebody who's being just bashed online? Others in your, in your workplace, what do you do when someone's not treated fairly? What do you do when someone, you know, they, they don't get that, that bonus maybe they deserved? Maybe they don't get the promotion that you know they deserved. They don't get the new office that maybe they deserved. Are you going to speak out? What about when people don't get the care they, they deserve, the care they need? And then when it comes to care, like, like, when, there's, when there's sorrow or there's pain, we minister the way Jesus does. This is what I love about our church, because our connect groups do this so well. You do this so well, church. I've seen this. But it happens in our city, too. The way we minister at Jack Lowe, the way we minister at, at Bachman Lake, we're actively seeking to promote the gospel. And when we actively work to prevent decay, we promote what is good and right in this world, and it reflects the character of God, and it hinders the work of evil. So not only do we work to hinder evil, but we also work to be consistent. Let's keep reading in 14 and 15. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Jesus again draws from the Old Testament. He's referring here to Isaiah 42 6. Isaiah 42 6 says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. He's speaking directly to his followers as he draws from this, this covenant language in Isaiah. And so what Isaiah is doing, he's referencing the the servant in Isaiah 42. And so this servant is filled by the Spirit who frees nations, establishes justice and righteousness, and is given by God as a covenant for the people and a light for the nations. Now that light has come. He is the true source of light. And here's what he's doing. He's passing that light Onto his followers. His followers are messengers of the good news, and God is establishing his new covenant. See, Jesus is speaking this, this identity into his followers. Right? I can imagine being there going, like, wait a minute, I like I'm I'm not really used to this. I've maybe I've barely been following Jesus, and now Jesus, you're you're speaking directly to to me? What do you mean I'm salt? What do you mean I'm, I'm light? See, this is a, it's a shared identity. Your past doesn't define you. All the laws that the, that the, uh, that the Jews would, be, would have to follow during this time is say, no, 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 we're not doing that anymore. See, this is key because our righteousness is not given to us by what we do. It's through Jesus Because I'm found righteous by God through his son, I can now actively share that righteousness with everyone else. So when I place my faith, when I place my trust in Jesus Christ, it's no longer about what I've done in the past. It's no longer about me trying to earn my way uh, to to freedom and, and freedom from shame and from guilt. I'm declaring Jesus as Lord And he declares me as righteous. So when God sees me, he doesn't see my sin. He sees me as righteous. 
And so my relationship with God, right? We do this often because we think God's kind of up here, but like the, the vertical relationship with God impacts how now I can interact with everybody else. That's why Jesus uses the analogy of the city on a hill. He says, a city, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. I mean, it was easily seen in this area. He'd be, he'd be teaching and he could point to the town over here. He could point to this town over here. Like these are on a hill. They're not to be hidden. And when he talks about a, a lamp, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. It's set up high to give light to the house. It's getting rid of the darkness that's present. Like it's absurd to, to cover a lamp up. It's, like, it's absurd to, to, to take a lamp, light it, and then just like put a giant basket over it. The whole house needs the light. You need a consistent flame to work in the house. You ever go on a walk, maybe in the dark, maybe it's at camp, maybe it's in the woods, and you give your flashlight to, to the kids? Anybody do that? There's a reason we don't. <laughs> Think about it. You're walking around just doing this with the flashlight, or it's on and it's off, and it's like, I, I need you to shine that light right here because we got to see where we need to go. I don't want to step on something that's, you know, going to bite me or going to tr make me fall, whatever else, right? I need a consistent light to shine that way. See, this is the problem with the church. I'm talking about the larger church, the big church, and the next generation. Because they see the church as inconsistent. There's a, a group that have come together, uh, Movement Day. Uh, it's now Next Move DFW. They've got stats about how the the next generation sees the church specifically here in, in DFW. And if you even think about over the, what's happened over the last couple of months, just in our, in our kind of city, in our context, like you've seen just pastors failing. The lights have, have dimmed and, and flickering. And so what, what, what Next Move DFW did is they, they partnered with the Arbor Research Group, and this is actually a couple years ago, but they discovered that the next generation is Gen Z at the time was like ages 16 to 22. But they see the church as irrelevant, unloving, and inauthentic. They go on to say that 62% of, uh, of those leaving the church do so before the age of 18. Oftentimes we've said, well, yeah, we want to, uh, why are all these kids leaving after college? It's 60% after college or more. Well, now so it's 62% leave before the age of 18. So how do we turn this around? See, as pastors, this is a challenge to me and it's our, it's our staff is we got to stay consistent. In other words, stay faithful. See, we need others to, to just come around us for prayer and accountability. Church family, we, we need you. We need you. So my prayer has, has been for, for, for protection of our team and the people on my staff. Because our inconsistency is what pushes others away. We have the light of the gospel that's to draw others toward Christ. And so when we hide it, other people don't get to see the goodness that exists. And it can be like, for all of us, it can be covered by all kinds of, of things. Charles Spurgeon calls it the, the busyness of life. I mean, it can be our kids' schedules. It can be stress at work. But what happens is, is all those things leads to unhealthy outlets such as addictions. And when that happens, it douses our flame. See, we don't shine our light when it's, when it's convenient. Again, this is, who, this is who we are. So how can I be consistent? How can we be consistent? This is where your personal time with the Lord matters each and every day. What habits have you established that, that allow you to be consistent? Are you living out of the, the time you spend with Jesus every day? And you may be going like, I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. What do you, what do you mean? 
We can help set that up. We can help kind of give you a plan or something. But this is why we have, have dwell. This is why we have our dwell readings. It's to help establish a rhythm of hearing and then responding to the word of God every day and then living that out. Because I was struck by this. This is where the Spirit convicted me over the last, uh, over the last two to three months. Is that the time that I was spending with the Lord, like I was spending alone while I'm reading Scripture and I'm praying, stayed in that area, in my house. And the time that where, where God was speaking to me and the Spirit of God is working in my life wasn't being carried out into my daily interactions. Wasn't being carried out in my daily interactions with my, with, with my family. Wasn't being carried out with my daily interactions with, uh, with, with the people I work with. Now, I'm, I'm a work in progress here, but, but, but I want to be consistent. And so the light which I am to be was like, is just hidden by this religious facade. Where I can do all the nice like little churchy things and I can serve people, but man, I'm not being changed I'm not being transformed by the Spirit of God. The light which we are should shine through that. In other ways, you've heard us talk a lot about baptism over the last several weeks because we've got Baptism Sunday coming up where we're going to be baptizing out, outside. But the best way to shine your light is through baptism. Baptism shows that you're ready to live this out, this, this way of Jesus. You're ready to live this out consistently. I mean, you heard Pastor Jeff say this last week, but ba baptism is the first act of obedience for the follower of Jesus. You become the lamp that's placed on a stand for all to see. Jesus is Lord means you have a new master and your allegiance has shifted. Baptism matches with who Jesus says you are. And so if you've never been baptized, are you going to do that? Will you do that? You can text baptism. You saw it on the screen earlier. You can text baptism to 74899. We'd love to have a conversation with you. We'd love to help guide you, to help you see what it looks like to follow Jesus. What about in your workplace? Are you consistent in your workplace? I know, a guy who's a, I know a guy who's a light in his, in his workplace. The reason is, is he's had the opportunity to pray for people in his workplace. And I'm sure there's others a, as well, but I want to reference just him. But is it, it, just, it, it didn't happen overnight. But he continued to just ask the question, like, hey, how are you doing? How's it going? And people continued to start just coming to him and say, man, I just, I need prayer. <laughs> See, together we do this out in the world. Maybe it's how you lead a meeting. Maybe it's how you, you, you talk to coworkers. But you're consistently a light. And you're going, man, I, I don't, like, you don't know where I work. This is a challenge. It's really hard. But let me just encourage you to tell you and remind you that, man, that Jesus has already done this. That Jesus goes before you in those moments where he's already maybe prompting this person through the Spirit. They're saying, man, I, something's going on here, and all you're doing is you're being a link in the chain to help them get there, to help them get to see who Jesus is. Because we're living out of who Jesus says we are. So we actively work to hinder evil. We're consistent because our lights don't flicker. And out of that leads us to this, is that we finally, we work to build beauty. We work to build beauty. Verse 16, Matthew 5, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. This is where salt and light begin to, to work together. Verse 16 sums all this, all this up. And so these are the results. 
It spurs us on to be visible as we go out into the darkness. So if we, you know, you remember the last part of the Beatitudes, that, that us being a light by doing good works, guess what? That might be disliked. People aren't going to like that when you push back. People aren't going to like when you maybe have a conversation that's different than maybe how they believe. He goes on to say it may, it may lead to persecution. Look at what he says, Matthew 5, back in 5.10. The end of the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. Jesus goes on to say that they, hey, guess what? They persecuted the prophets too. And he's going to face the exact same persecution. Jesus' followers are carrying out his message. And so as Jesus reminds us, it's not about us. Our good works are what bring glory to the Father. And so when this happens, it proves our shared identity that we have with Christ. It, it, it allows others to not see me and to see what I'm doing, but to see God, to see how he's working, to see the beauty he's created through his church. And when the church is operating at full strength, those on the outside get to experience all of God's goodness. So that happens when we, when we work together, when we work, all work together actively in our city, when we actively work in our schools, our neighborhoods, our places of work, as I mentioned. It's not an individual effort now, but it's, it's collective. And so as we shine brighter and more beautiful, it casts light on the darkness and allows others to see our beautiful God. We have a telescope at home, and we've kind of played with it a little bit, but um, has anyone looked at, you ever looked at the moon through, through a telescope? It's kind of fun. You're not supposed to, to look at it, though, when there's a full moon. Learned about, learned about that. Because when the, when the moon's full, what's, what's happening is, is like it's, it's actually, it's so bright that it actually, it hides all of the, kind of the, dif the different features and characteristics and the landscape that you can actually see um, on the moon. But right, when the, when the moon is, is full, it's, it's lighting everything else, right? You're able to kind of walk around. You can actually see really well if you're out in the, you know, you're out in the country or the woods. You don't need a kid with a flashlight at that point. It's because the original source is from the sun, casting light onto the moon and then onto everything else. The sun shares its light with the moon for everyone to experience at that point. See, the point is not to look at the moon, but to be in awe of the true source. Now, C.S. Lewis says it, his famous quote, he says, I, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Again, this, this shared identity cultivates goodness in the world so that others come to know Jesus. Others experience the blessings of God. Others are in awe of who God is. We're not bringing glory to ourselves, but to him and to him alone. And so how do we build, how do we build beauty as, as the church? I'm going to focus on two things. One is this, is you got you to share it. You got to share your faith. You got to share about the goodness of God in your own life. Like the fact is that God chooses the rebels he chooses those who rebel against him to be brought into his family. Those who have been, think about this, like the, those who've been far from God have been brought in. And so as we produce more disciples, it produces more light. We have a story to share. Another way is through, is through serving. Serving. Specifically, leading and serving the next generation. That's what helps fend off darkness. You can be a light inside the church. I mean, if you're worried about the, the next generation, I mean, serve with them. Be a light for them. Show them how to, how to live in this, in this strange new world. 
This is a challenge to parents. We're going to do this actually in front of the whole church next hour with our, with our child dedications. But it's the challenge to the parents that you are the primary disciple maker for those, for those kids. You are raising them up to follow Jesus. But they don't get to do it alone. Is that the church now comes alongside them and supports them and helps them do it. That's how we ignite the next generation. Maybe it's just through serving in our city. Maybe, it's, maybe you need to go on a mission trip. But we're taking the light we have and we're sharing it with others. Maybe it's South Texas, Nepal, the Caribbean, or it's Guatemala. Again, it's not an individual effort. You're not alone. This is the church doing this, uh, doing this together. That's how we build beauty. So how are you going to do it? How are you going to build beauty? How will you be a light? Because to be salt and light means we hinder evil. We're consistent as we follow Jesus. Our lights don't flicker while we work to build beauty. We're working together as the church so that others don't see us. They see Jesus. They see Jesus. Because the reality is, is that we're agents of the gospel. And we have a message to share. That's what I'm reminded of in, in Philippians 2 when Paul says, we shine like lights in a dark world. So let's let our lights shine. Let's shine them bright. Let's pray. Holy God, we, we give glory to you because it's through us, it's not by our own efforts, it's not by anything we've done that allow us to do that. You've, you've transformed us. And so God, as we, as we shift our time into a, a, a moment just of, of remembrance, we're remembering the fact that you, God, came for us, that you are the light, you sent your light for us. And so now we have the opportunity to just say thanks. We say thank you for dying on the cross. We say thank you for covering our sin. And we say thank you for allowing us to be a part of your kingdom work where the light has now come for us for all others to see. So we bring glory to you now, and we thank you. Amen.